During the early era of Hollywood, Native Americans were portrayed as violent savages, plundering the white man's resources, raping their women, and breaking treaty agreements. In late Hollywood, the opposite is shown. Now the natives are peace-loving spiritually attuned people, always humble, who are victimized, tortured and killed by the evil white man. Consider that both these views are far off the mark. Two veils that cover our real history. I submit that Seattle was not built by European settlers in the late 1800s. It was perhaps built by the Mongolian Tartarian people who controlled an empire that today encompasses China, Russia, Western Canada, Western USA, and maybe more. A technologically advanced empire that was defeated through wars from the air and floods. An empire whose history has been erased. The defeated people later became the indigenous around the world. I assert Seattle was originally a city that covered a much larger area, encompassing what is today known as Olympia, Tacoma, and Seattle in Washington state. This is why the cityscape stretches all the way from Seattle to Olympia, continuously for 100 miles. It was dressed in the same super architecture we find around the world, an architecture foreign to the wood and hut building settlers. The mythology of the native Duwamish people, confirms. Eleptilicum, the first people, a race of giants, whose actions defined a pre-human mythic world. Water covered the country. It washed away the country. Many people were drifting about. Muskrat was on a stick, very sad. Their world had been drowned in a great flood. The little birds, beaver, land otter, and the fishes, all the people, wished to get land from below. This world had been preceded by two eras, destroyed by fire, and by disease. Now, the third world had been drowned. Beaver went down below the flood. He could not get land. Birds fly in the sky, fishes swim in the sea, but landed folk, like beaver and land otter, looked to little muskrat to save them. You try. If you find land below, you get it. Doesn't that sound exactly like hundreds of other indigenous myths? Doesn't that explain why, on old maps, northwestern America is labeled land of giants, and why it's flooded on other maps? Eliptilicum is ancient German. Eliptilicum. The people of El, the people coming from Eli, a term for God, found around the world. Wikipedia tells us this little tidbit about the history of the Duwamish. In the year 1700, a massive earthquake shook the northwest coast, felt as far away as Japan. The quake resulted in a large tsunami which struck the coastline. This event is recorded in Duwamish oral history, in which Thunderbird participated in an ancient battle, shaking the ground and rolling up the waters. The massive global flood events are recorded in all cultures. It's not just a local tsunami, it's one of the major flood events that buried the cities of the American West. If you recall our previous research about the Dakota Badlands, you know the Thunderbird shot fire out of the sky to melt entire cities. Now Thunderbird is at it again in Seattle. Thunderbird is the flying device that waged war against the natives from the air. Let's have a peek at the official mainstream narrative. Pause the video and read it carefully. Isn't it strange how these timelines never include the history of the natives? You're supposed to believe that nothing of note happened before European settlers arrived. Before that, they were nothing more than dust-pounding hunter-gatherers for 100,000 years. According to this timeline, Seattle had a population of only 300 in the 1850s. The Wikipedia page Demographics of Seattle shows even less in 1860. Only 188 people. It's therefore odd that a 1858 map of the area shows a detailed survey grid corresponding with Seattle, Olympia, Tacoma and other towns. This is a close-up of the Seattle grid. History books say that Seattle was founded in 1865 and first incorporated in 1869. So, what's the label Seattle doing on a 1858 map? Was the name given to the cartographer by natives? Maybe. Olympia was an even larger grid. You could argue that these are surveying lines to plan where to build, but the Klondike Gold Rush didn't start until eight years later. I've previously shown how grand architecture in Helena, Montana, San Francisco, and other places, is explained by Gold Rush, people rushing to dig for gold. The same excuse is provided for Seattle, a city built from nothing, within a few years, because of the Gold Rush. Historians claim that the building of Seattle coincided with the Klondike Gold Rush. But Klondike was in Dawson City, Canada. 
That's 2,000 miles far away from Seattle, at the border to Alaska. Historians say, well, it's because there was a route to Klondike through Seattle. But they also say that only few got rich, most people dug for gold in vain. So, it's doubtful that the gold rush in Klondike had anything to do with wealth in Seattle. According to the map, the city was either already standing or being planned long before the gold rush. I believe it was already standing hundreds of years prior. Olympia still looks like a grid today, like so many American cities, and unlike European cities that have a lot of curves, circles, triangles, rectangles, etc. in their streets. Seattle is also still a grid. Foreigners who visit America are always puzzled at how straight streets are, especially in the West. They go on and on in a straight line, regardless of natural features. We've seen in previous videos, evidence that these grids were already there before the settlers built their cities. There is a web page featuring municipal maps of Seattle. My screenshot shows that at one time, maps from the 1790s and 1840s were offered. But when I click, it says the items can no longer be found. Whoever removed the items, forgot to remove the filter index. Why would they be removed? Because it doesn't sync with Seattle history starting in 1850. At the Library of Congress, I did find one map of the area, published in 1798 in London. The timeline saying Seattle started in 1851 can't be correct. We already have detailed maps in the 1700s, and the places are already named in English. The terrain is detailed and accurate. It's difficult to understand how this was mapped without an airplane or other high-tech means. The map was made by George Vancouver who apparently died in 1798, the year the map was published. But Mr. Vancouver had only ships at his disposal. As far as I can tell, he did not have drones or access to Google Maps. But, the map doesn't show any of the larger cities I claim existed. In my view, they are buried. A flood that moved land masses. The cities were excavated from below the ground from the 1830s onwards. We see a lot of ports on this map. Port Susan, Port Discovery, Port Hudson, Port Orland, Port Wilson and more. The dictionary tells us that a port is a maritime facility comprising of one or more wharves or loading areas, where ships load and discharge cargo and passengers. Even after wading through mainstream sources, it's not clear to me why there should be so many ports with English names and lands inhabited by native Indians. Wikipedia tells me that for centuries, the Duwamish people lived in 17 towns around Seattle. These towns are omitted on the map. Why? Some historians have suggested it's because Mr. Vancouver didn't dare go on land, so he doesn't know the locations and sizes of Native American towns. But, if Vancouver never ventured on land, how did he know the terrain so well? The only large building mentioned in the timeline prior to 1875 is the Washington Territorial University, built in 1861. So, when exactly was this large city supposed to have been built? I continue down the timeline, but still find no answer. In 1889, Seattle is suddenly referred to as a city, but the only mentions of buildings are two opera houses. Am I missing something here? Sometime between 1875 and 1890, Seattle must have seen the largest construction project in the northwestern Americas, but history makes no mention of it. The historical timeline of Seattle apparently has no place for the magnificent superhuman feat of building this large city. Researchers are asking questions. This video was in fact inspired by these questions. This video is just an introduction to something I find really fascinating. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part 2.